Welcome to GPS, God's Prophetic Surprises, the program about the book of Revelation that takes an intergenerational approach to understanding this fascinating book. I'm John Pauline. I'm professor of religion at Loma Linda University. And I'm Nick Snell. I am a youth and young adult pastor at the uh, Chapel Oaks Church in Shawnee, Kansas. And I'm Guilherme Borda, and I'm a PhD student in New Testament at Andrews University. I think it's really neat that, uh, that we can be meeting together here, even though Nick is in uh, Kansas. He's uh, with us uh, here in the LLBN studio by the miracles of modern technology. So uh, this is awesome, and uh, we're glad to be together uh, once again. <clears throat> uh, for those of you who are watching, uh, we're going to get into Revelation 14 this time. So we invite you to get your Bibles out, uh, get your phones, uh, uh, your tablets, uh, uh, however you access the Word of God, uh, to join us in Revelation 14 at this time. And uh, I'm going to ask Nick if he would uh, lead the way, reading verses 1 through 5. All right, I'll be reading from the New International Version. Then I looked, and there before me was the Lamb, standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a sound from heaven like the roar of rushing waters and like a loud peal of thunder. The sound I heard was like that of harpists playing their harps. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. These are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they remained virgins. They follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They were purchased from among mankind and offered as first fruits to God and the Lamb. No lie was found in their mouths. They are blameless. All right, thank you. There's, there's a lot of stuff in here that maybe isn't obvious uh, at first glance, but one of them is, uh, w uh, how did you introduce uh, verse 1 of chapter 14, Nick? What, what were the first words in your translation? Mine said, then I looked. Uh, what version is that? NIV. NIV, New International Version, okay. Interesting piece here, if you read the Greek, is that it's kai edon, which is basically, and I saw. You know, then I looked is a, is a fair translation, but it's not a literal one as such. So, uh, and I saw. And uh, Guillermo, you and I were talking a little while ago, and you said you've been doing a little looking at this phrase. And uh, tell us what you found. Yeah, it's interesting that uh, this phrase is used, uh, functions as a, uh, a device to organize the vision. It helps us to see the different parts of the vision. Of course, there's a lot of things that John is perceiving, and that's one of a uh, verb of perception. But when you go to uh, chapter 13, it begins with, with that, and I saw, and it was that sea, you no, know, that beast coming out of the sea. And then later, it's still in chapter 13, and I saw, and it is that beast coming out of the land. And then now in chapter 14, and I saw, but instead of seeing another beast coming from somewhere else, it's something else that he sees. He sees the lamb standing on Mount Zion. But he continues with that uh, sequence later in verse 6, chapter 14, verse 6, and I saw, and it is the section that we call the three angels' messages, and then later again, and I saw, in verse 14, mm. sees uh, the one like a son of man on a cloud, and that's a new section. I mean, I'm not saying an overall big section, but these little shorter sections or scenes in throughout, mm. they're going throughout the vision in this broader central section of the book. I think, I think most scholars who study Revelation uh, would say this kai edon, this and I saw, is, uh, is a very important structuring device in the book. For example, it starts uh, chapter 5, and I saw, chapter 7, and I saw, mm -hmm. uh, chapter 7, 9, and I saw a great multitude. Mm -hmm. you know? So he... Uh, he tends to use this at strategic points. And so if you're going to make a structure of chapter 14, then you would say, where, where would the pieces fall? 
Yes, we could use that and I saw. So beginning in verse 1, and I saw that all the way to verse 5, that's a section. Mm -hmm. um, of course, you know, uh, he could repeat that, but he doesn't, right? Like you said, he seems to use it in a way that's strategic to convey the structure. Then in verse 6, begins another portion, which is then what we call the proclamation of the three angels' messages. Um, and then I saw, he says, this angel. He's going to later see angels again, other angels, those two other angels. But he doesn't say for each angel, and I saw, and I saw. He doesn't. Mm. And then in mm. verse 14, then he uses this again, then I saw, and it uh, goes to a different um, scene again of this vision. So if you're going to structure this chapter, then you would divide it at verse 1, verse 6, and verse 14. Yes. That's interesting because I've never thought that verse 13 belongs to the three angels' messages. I think very few people would say that it does. Yet it comes before the end I saw. <laughs> and, and if that's the case, then maybe if that's included in the three angels' messages, it might mean something different than... You know, I've, I've kind of always seen verse 13 as sort of standing by itself. And, and so uh, I'll have to rethink that. That's a good observation. Appreciate that. Uh, Nick, what did he see in verse 1? I'll just read it again. It says, And there before me was the Lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. Well, and interesting, yeah. it then goes in going, we were talking about the and I saw. Mm -hmm. I noticed this pattern of and I heard. Ooh. Uh, also. Where is that? Up. And verse 2. Oh, okay. Um, I, I've, I've seen um, somewhere in the three angels' messages, they, they saw and then they heard also. Um, so maybe another pattern to look for. Okay, well, we've seen before that the heard and saw kind of a thing is going. For example, in chapter 7, uh, he heard the 144,000, then he sees the great multitude. Uh, in chapter 5, he heard, you know, the, the lion of the tribe of Judah, he sees the lamb as it were slain. And we, mm -hmm. we drew the conclusion that those two usually mean the same thing. Do you think that's the case here, Nick? I'd have to study a little bit more. Yeah, so you just, you're pointing out that there's this pattern here. I would notice that it's in the opposite order. He sees mm. and then he hears. I think it's pretty consistent if he hears first, what he sees is the same thing as what he heard, uh, maybe in a different symbolic form. Uh, here it's the opposite. I, I noticed that as I was preparing for this. I, I don't get the impression that, that this is part of that pattern. What do you think, Guillermo? You know, I, yes, there is that thing that you find as, such as in the beginning of the book, you know. Yeah. But here, when you see what he heard and try to see if it would mean the same thing as what he saw. So he saw the lamb and then this group of people that are associated with the land is 144,000. Yeah. What is it that he heard? A voice from heaven, like the voice of many waters, and like the voice of loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. They sang as it were a new song. Now, who is it that is doing this singing? Mm. It says later, and no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. So... This song is a song that only those people know. Mm. So this sound is somehow associated with them because they're the only ones that know the song. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would, now are they all? It just would be nice if they actually appeared there. Exactly. You know, if they, and I heard the 144,000 exactly. singing, uh, then you could say, okay, this heard and saw thing is actually working. Exactly. Or maybe instead of 144,000, he'd say remnant or something. Exactly. You see, and then you could say, well, those it must be the same thing. Exactly. But he doesn't do that. Uh, interesting point. Mm -hmm. But, guys, this is, uh, what's this Mount Zion all about? Just shows up here in the middle of nowhere, a lamb standing on Mount Zion. Uh, what is Mount Zion and why is it here? Anybody have a thought on that? Well, Mount Zion is such a theologically loaded concept in the Bible, right? 
Mount Zion is this desirable place in the presence of God. The, this, this location that is the center, the center of everything that uh, God is trying to do on earth. But then here, it, it transcends that, right? So you see, um, first, David conquers that place in Zion, right? And then you have Jerusalem, Zion. It's, it's kind of, in a sense, interchangeable. But uh, because you have Jerusalem, the temple, the temple mount, um, Zion, these are all terms that are connected in the Old Testament, right, one so way or another. So you're saying Mount, mount Zion is another way of saying Jerusalem. Yes. But why not say Jerusalem? Well, I mean, you could say, you could say later you do have Jerusalem ah. here. But Zion, and it's interesting that this is the only place in Revelation that uses the word Zion. But Come with me. Go ahead, go ahead. All right. <laughs> Nick, read that verse again. All right, so we have it fresh in our minds. Sure. Chapter 14, verse looked, 1. Yep. Mm -hmm. Then I looked, and there before me was the Lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. Okay. Come with me to Joel in the Old Testament. It's one of those little books toward the end of the Old Testament. Joel chapter 2 and verse 32. And it's, uh, this part of Joel is kind of the story of the end time from a, an Old Testament perspective. That in the last days, enemy powers are going to come against Jerusalem and surround it and try to conquer it. Okay? At that time, notice what it says here, Joel 2.32. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there will be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the survivors whom the Lord calls. So the idea here in Joel 2 is, is in the final battle of earth's history. Um, there's going to be a people in Jerusalem, on Mount Zion, that are going to be saved. Now that was literal from the Old Testament perspective. Israel was a literal place. These nations were literal nations, okay, surrounding Jerusalem. Uh, but in the New Testament, these same terms, Israel, Jerusalem, tends to take on other meanings. Yes. So... What is John doing in putting the lamb on Mount Zion? Or what is the vision doing in, in calling that to his attention? In mentioning Mount Zion, it's an allusion to Joel 2. But notice in Joel 2.32 what the people of God are called. It says that there will be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the survivors whom the Lord calls. Now, the little piece of this that isn't obvious in the English is that word survivors is the word remnant. Where did we find the word remnant in the book of Revelation? The people that are the target of the dragon. All right. In chapter 12 and verse 17, you had the dragon angry with the woman and went away to make war with the remnant of her seed. Why doesn't he just say remnant at this point? The lamb is, he could say Mount Zion, but he's with the remnant on Mount Zion. Why does he say the lamb is standing on Mount Zion, making the reader go back here? Mm -hmm. I would suggest that it's his way of saying remnant, 144,000, great multitude, different ways of saying the same thing. You see, chapter 14 is where the remnant side of the conflict is elaborated. Mm -hmm. In chapter 13, we were looking at the dragon, the beast, the false prophet, you know, the, the, the land beast, etc., uh, the enemy powers. So the dragon's war is described in chapter 13. Mm -hmm. But in chapter 14, the remnant side of the conflict is in focus. So I think... Uh, taking the time to, to go behind the scene and, and pick up on this Mount Zion, it turns out to be a really important reference because using the process of illusion that he's 
pointing back to the Old Testament, saying, reader, you want to understand me, you need to know Joel. All right? So if there's any of you out there that says, man, I can't make head or tail out of the book of Revelation, you're not alone. But there is a way forward. And the way forward is to understand Revelation in the light of the Old Testament background. And here, the Mount Zion is critical because it tells us that he's picking up from the remnant in 1217 and showing us God's end time people in their final uh, spiritual crisis. Well, it's interesting that uh, even though he doesn't use the word remnant here, in chapter 7 you have that scene in which you have servants of God that are sealed mm -hmm. and the amount of of those servants is 144,000. And where are they sealed? On the forehead. On the foreheads, okay. That tracks here too. Exactly. And oh. it's interesting that it says 12,000 from this tribe and this many, and 12,000 for that tribe and so forth and so forth, which would give me the impression that these are a remnant. These are a portion of the professed people of God, but these are the ones that are truly servants of God. It's similar to the uh, scene in Ezekiel, the sealing in Ezekiel, where there's a condition for the sealing to happen. In Ezekiel, it has something to do with the, those who care. Mm -hmm. They care about what's going on. Okay. Right? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And so the sealing in itself already would imply that this is sort of a remnant because there's those that are, that are sealed and then because the, the fact that it says this many for this tribe, this many for that tribe makes me think that there's people from each tribe that are not sealed. And then mm -hmm. therefore this is the remnant in the sense that these are the ones that remain faithful. They not only profess to be the people of God, they not only profess to, to bear his name, they actually bear his name in profession and in in, in a sense, an embodiment of, uh, of, of God's law, of allowing God to work through them and in them to, 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 so they can truly represent him on earth. Nick, I was, I was just wondering, this concept of name on the forehead, what, what comes to mind when you see that? Uh, it, it makes me think of God's law being on our foreheads, um, God writing his, like it says here, his, his name on our forehead. So, and I've heard this connection between God's law and his character. The name of God mm. is his character. It, it, it's just kind of all connected there. You're making me think uh, of Deuteronomy 6. I think mm -hmm. that's what you're referring to, aren't you? Yeah. Where, where they were to keep the law of God on their, for, you know, the forehead and on the hand which mm -hmm. is counterfeited by uh, the beast in, in chapter 13. Go ahead. What, what does that mean, though, do you think? I think it means that it's, uh, his law has become part of us. It's part of, it's how we think. We've, we're just aligned uh, with him. Um, and I had a question um, going back to the then I saw, uh, oh. or and I saw, um, it's just a question of chronology because this sounds like okay this is Jesus coming and he's saved everybody they're not uh, looking like they just barely made it through this war they're looking victorious at this point and then there's verse 6 that comes up in the three angels messages which looks like there's this call for more to still come in and, and come to God. So I'm just curious if there's any, uh, if this is chronological or what's going on here. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I think the and I saw sounds almost like, well, first this happened, then that happened, then that happened. But we've seen often in Revelation that the next vision doesn't necessarily move forward chronologically. It can move backwards instead. So uh, the end I saw is introducing a new vision, but not necessarily a new point in time. But what do you think? Is this in heaven or on earth? Are these, you know, <laughs> That's not Mount a straight Zion, That's Yeah, Mount Zion <laughs> is an earthly place, right? 
But where are they singing the song? These people are singing before the throne of God, but then we should remember that in the book of Revelation, dwelling in heaven is compatible with what we would see with our physical eyes, faithful followers of Jesus walking on earth. They dwell in heaven in this symbolic sense because that's their place, but yet they walk here, right? It I does mean, say that uh, I heard a sound from heaven, like the roar of rushing waters and like the <laughs> peal of thunder. So there's a sound from heaven, but where's, where's the sound coming from? There's a voice from heaven. Yeah. Um, and so that sound sounds like, you know, that, that's compatible with Mount Zion. If they're in Mount Zion, and here comes a voice from heaven. All right. But then it says that uh, they, sang. they sang before the throne. Mm -hmm. So is that an earthly throne or a heavenly throne? I personally see this as this is heavenly throne of God, but I see this, I could be mistaken, please correct me. I see this because, you see, because we do have the scene of Jesus coming later in mm -hmm. the chapter. Mm -hmm. as, I, as I see this, this is the people of God before the throne of God spiritually. They already have access to the throne of God. Their praises reach the throne of God now. But... There's this, on chapter 13, for, in chapter 13, we see the dragon and his gang. Here now we have Jesus and his friends or brothers. So this the is language the counterpart the of, of, John. Of, the, of the earthly events going on in chapter 13. Exactly. And then this is, like you said, the side of the remnant of this conflict. And then later in verses 6 to 13, or depending on how you divide that, 6 onwards, this is the message that they give. So why you have the message... Hmm of false worship in chapter 13, promoted by the associates of the dragon, you have the message of true worship in chapter 14, promoted by the associates of the Lamb. So these things are happening on earth, but in Revelation you have those who dwell on earth. That's not necessarily yeah. everybody well, that dwells what, on What earth. if one of our listeners is saying right now, that is quite a stretch, you know? I mean, it, it, it's got them in heaven, so why do you put them on earth, you know? Well, the way, the way, the reason why I am, the reason why I'm reading it this way is that I see the coming of Jesus later. Uh -huh. That's one point. But another point is that you do have that notion in Revelation of those who dwell on earth versus those who dwell in heaven. And those who dwell on earth is not everybody that we see when we go out on the streets that live on the earth. That is a theologically loaded phrase that generally, at least, is associated with those who are not on God's side. Mm, okay. they, they might even, they're the object of missions and evangelism, at least at points in the book, but they're not on God's side. So you're saying not point. every time it talks about heaven in Revelation, it's actually literal heaven. It may be a spiritual heaven that, uh, uh, you know, I think of Ephesians, doesn't it say, uh, we live in heavenly places in Christ Jesus? From the New Testament perspective, <clears throat> when you receive Christ, it's like you are in him. Here's a human being sitting on the throne of God, and he's representing the human race, and, and, and we can be in him, represented by him, in heavenly place. So the New Testament can confidently say, well, you are in heavenly places in Christ, because that's where he is, and he's a human being. Or, 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 or we have in the New Testament this notion that we have come to Mount Zion. Like, how come? Well, we have, you know, spiritually. Now, I'm not saying that every time in Revelation that mentions sure. heaven, that it is a symbol for, for something that is happening on earth with a connection to heaven. I don't think it's every time at all. But this part here, I do think it is because, now, of course, I mean, someone may have a different reading and I might be incorrect, but the, I, I'm... Reading it this way, in light of this broader notion of the book that connects heaven with the people on the side of God, where, mm -hmm. whether they are here, human beings in this struggle, or whether they are angels literally physically there around it, um, or people who, are those who dwell on earth 
that are not just people who have their address on some street here on planet Earth, but are those whose place is this Earth in a sense that is distorted, in a sense that they are not on the side of God. So I'm using this broader notion that you see in the book. I think that is a play here. That seems to be a play at other places. I think it's a play here. I could be mistaken. Nick, would you read verse 6? Yeah, I will. Um, could I just say, clarify with Guillerme, are you saying that just as um, the devil is portrayed in Revelation as having interaction between the people that are kind of on his side, uh, that there is this transcendent connection between the, the faithful and heaven all along? Does that make sense? Yes, I mean, th those who are in Christ, they, in a, in a symbolic sense at least, they dwell in heaven. Yeah. Even though we know we haven't made it to heaven yet, literally. But there is a true connection. Of course, Jesus is there representing us in a sense, right? Uh, I mean, think about, for example, Revelation 1. Jesus is walking among this candle, um, the, the, the lampstand. That looks like a sanctuary scene, but these lampstands represent the churches. Mm -hmm. why, why are they in the sanctuary if they, we know, we can go yeah. today to the place where the church was located. Most of the sanctuary right? scenes in Revelation are in heaven, and, and clearly so. Mm -hmm. But in chapter 1, uh, the imagery suggests that it's not uh, literally in yeah. heaven, but rather more spiritually in heaven. It makes me think of, mm -hmm. Uh, maybe you've seen this graphic where there's the rear view mirror. The rear view mirror says objects and are closer than they appear. Mm -hmm. And uh, Christians will put a spin on that and say, you know, God is closer than you think. And so in this context, we could say heaven is closer than you think. That we, we have access right now to God in heaven uh, through Jesus. Yeah. Um, so I do. I will read that verse now. You asked yeah. for verse six. It says, okay. "Then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people." All right. So when the gospel goes forth at the last days, the gospel goes forth to those who live on the earth. Who needs mm -hmm. to hear the gospel? Those who don't believe. Who needs to hear the gospel? Those who are opposed to God, right? So right there was in the text, those who live on earth is a way of speaking of those who oppose, like mm -hmm. you were saying. Yes. Uh, perhaps mm -hmm. though they are depicted as being in heaven uh, in, in this particular passage, it's meaning that in a more spiritual sense because chapter 14 is the counterpart of chapter 13 where we're seeing the outcome of the dragon's war. Uh, yes. in the final crisis. Well, we're down to just a few seconds here. So I want to thank uh, all of you who have uh, chosen to spend this hour, this half hour with us, and we're going to do it again next time. So we'll see you then.